So, Roni, uh, your face graced the cover of Wired last month, and I got to go down to Florida and see what you were doing with Magic Leap. Cool. And it leads me to this one basic question. Are you really here? <laughs> I think so. Okay, good place to start. Um, so, Roni, you, um, you have created something that we all want to understand. Um, I want you to explain to me first how it works. It's a great question. So um, I call what we do a mixed reality light field. And the inspiration came from, first of all, thinking about how we experience the world visually without any technology. And the idea was there's this amazing display we have in our brain already. It's processed by our visual cortex. And I thought we would never build a better display than that. So how could we get into that? And that led to the studying of how the visual world outside of us, which we call an analog light field, how that interfaces with your brain, the sort of physics and neurobiology interface, and allows that display in your brain to create all the amazing imagery that we're doing right now. And our digital light field is basically mimicking that process. It's allowing the brain to be a display and not replacing the display you already have with something inferior. It's trying to use what's there. OK, so how does it work? Um, well, the, the heavy lifting piece of what we do uh, we have to thank nature and biology. I mean, we evolved this incredible, um, this incredible brain that has 100 trillion connections, hundreds of billions of neurons, and somewhere around 40% plus is all about visual processing and perception. And what we're doing is we create a digital light field signal that is a biomimetic signal that is very similar to the analog light field that's coming in. And our signal blends with that one. So really, you have this one integrated signal coming from your eye retina system into the visual cortex. And you don't have something on top of the world. You don't have like a cell phone display in front of your eye, like what people think of with VR. You just have something which feels like an integrated natural blending of digital and physical. And that's what we call mixed reality light field. All of the details of how those 100 trillion neural connections work will be here for probably 10 years. Um, but it is, it is a blend of how the brain works plus our intense effort to mimic a signal very naturally uh, into your eye brain system. Um, so where did this idea start for you, Roni? Um, it was interesting. It started with like a creative impulse to try to do things that were not books or movies or video games. It was thinking like what was going to come next in terms of how you can experience computing and entertainment and media and just sort of imagining that. And then basically wanting to invent the technology to enable that. So it wasn't tech looking for like a purpose. It was like having this like kind of almost crazy creative vision and then wanting to build a tech that didn't exist to make that happen. And so, you know, many people have followed your story very closely and you are now at a place where you have this office in Florida, you are building out this new huge office in Florida, you have a demo that you're showing people and you have a steady stream of people who come through for this demo. What do they see? Um, they see amazing things. First of all, the, the visitors we have, it's completely surreal. It's like being in a Neil Stevenson novel, and he's one of the visitors. He actually works for us. Um, I was going to say, I think he's an employee. Yeah, he is. He is. Um, we, I mean, we're, we've, we've been attracting creators of all types, so writers, artists, musicians, uh, app developers, film companies, um, you know, giant computer companies, just anything the human imagination could think of has been showing up wanting to see how what they do combines with this new form of computing. And broadly, I think of it as a kind of contextual computing. It's aware of the surroundings, and it's interacting with you in a really human way. Um, and what they're experiencing is um, uh, all behind the scenes, we show people kind of our working prototypes. They're seeing real live experiences, really cool stuff, something we might show you in a couple minutes. Um, and they're also seeing our factory. We're building kind of a state-of-the-art SpaceX-type factory in Florida where uh, we have these giant aircraft carrier sized clean rooms where we're going to be producing our photonics. So all that's happening right now. But, and we kind of tour people through that. But you know, when we're thinking about the, the technology, I mean, in asking what they see, I, I want to know how you think it's going to be used. Because right now, at least, the major, the bulk of the conversation is happening around entertainment. But you're really thinking about this as something broader than entertainment, as a, as a, a new platform of sorts, right? A absolutely. Our, our goal is to get to all day, every day computing. And I think of it as like a full course meal. And our media goal is how do we get to a billion of seven people on the planet doing all day, every day mixed reality. Um, and, it, and you think of entertainment and media and games as sort of like the dessert. Um, and it, some people just want to go and eat their ice cream first, and that's cool. But 
we're going to have all the courses. We'll have the salad and the appetizer and the vegetarian meat. I'm vegetarian, so not, probably not steak. Um, but all the pieces, the, all the nutrients of what makes your day. It's really about what is your life like morning to the evening and how can mixed reality make it tinged a little bit better? How can we add a little bit of magic and make you actually a little bit smarter, sort so of amplify example, your brain? Give me an example of something I might do with it a decade from now. Um, probably within the decade, you might wake up and the first thing uh, you might see um, your assistant pop up and that assistant might be a very smart assistant and knows everything about your schedule and you say, what are we gonna do today? It's like, uh, you're going to the gym, you wanna have breakfast, yesterday you had a chocolate cake, so how about some salad? Um, it might lay out your whole day. Assistant, Let's say you wanna talk to your mom, okay. your mom just shows up, she's there and you have a conversation just like this. So since we're talking about time, um, within the decade that might happen, when are we gonna see Magic Leap? Um, I won't tell you when we're shipping it, but I will tell you a couple of things. Um, we are turning on the first production line of our factory throughout this summer. Okay. And that production line actually allows us to build uh, through real commercial processes what our first product's gonna be. Uh, so we are basically building a series of what we call pilots of, our real, of the real production unit. And we wanna be able to call a date with really high accuracy, and we want to make sure the product's good. So we may have a system when people visit us that looks like it should be shipping, but we're debugging, and when, when we say we're shipping, we really want to nail it. So, but it is coming soon. Coming soon. So what, what product is it that you will be manufacturing? What can you tell us? Um, think of it as a, uh, a mobile computing device that has an extremely powerful CPU, GPU. It has a real-time sensing computer and it also interacts with a cloud computing system. So really we have three computing systems in one. One does real-time awareness of the world, one that has a very powerful CPU, GPU um, that you walk around with, and one that's connected to a cloud and having like security and privacy around that. And all of it is enabling this contextual awareness of the world plus um, your ability to have this integration of mixed reality environments, characters, people, text. You just wanna see a screen, you wanna create a television, you could do that, you want to watch Breaking Bad, that'll be fun. Uh, if you want to have other things, like we might talk about soon, uh, they could just appear in your world. And it's really about not cluttering your eye, and it's about giving you complete control over that digital information. Um, I'm thinking of it like a sacred space. We do not want the dystopian view of AR that people think about. We want this to be, you have total control of your environment, you're not being assaulted by stuff. You can actually erase things that you don't want to see. You don't want to see a billboard that's physical. You could erase that and make that your Twitter feed. That's the kind of thing we're trying to do. Well, you know, as we think about this technology, you know, technology is, by its nature, a neutral force. It's yes. what humans being is to do with it. You're, you're thinking about introducing something so new and so potentially changing. How do you make sure, as best you can, that humans do right by it, do good with it? What does that even mean? Yeah, so I, I have a, we have guiding principles in the company, and we're going to try to socialize certain guiding principles as we come out. First of all, I think we're on the um, good side of the force. Uh, as a company, we try to be more Jedi than Sith, and I think there's sort of roads you can take in this world. You can do a dystopian version of what we're doing, and maybe somebody will, but um, our goal is to try to do the more positive view of the future and at least show a road. This is what it can be, um, and put some guideposts. Like here's some rails, if you want to have a good version of this, here's guidelines for developers, for creators, for users. Give them tools to create safe spaces or safe sacred spaces. And then you can imagine all the terrible things and those are things we basically think about not doing. And maybe someone else will do it. We can't prevent that, uh, but at least could put some guardrails and say if you go this way, you can have a wonderful experience. If you go that way, you've entered the dark zone. Right. Um, we, you know, there's free will. We don't control that, but we can at least point in a good direction. And in pointing in a good direction, one of the things that you're doing is you're working with a lot of partners right now, right? Yes. Yeah, some great partners. Um, so should what we is be announcing one of them? Uh, we could. I mean, did you bring somebody along? Yeah, we have, we have a couple friends uh, from a, uh, a little indie film company uh, in Northern California. They're making this movie about spaceships, and they have this bad guy who wears a black suit. I think his name is Darth Vader. So Let's I'd like to announce him up. John and Rob. <laughs>
and John Gaeta from Industrial Light and Magic. And now that I've done the heavy lifting of the introduction, maybe you can help us understand um, how your companies got to know each other. Yeah, well, the first time we met Roni, actually, was, you know, in the context, of course, of getting introduced to what Magic Leap was doing. And, I, you know, from the very beginning, uh, engaging with their team creatively and technically was just very inspiring to all of us. We're uh, at ILMX Lab, which is what John heads up on the creative side. We're looking at creating new kinds of immersive experiences, experiences of going into the worlds that we create. So Star Wars, and of course, we work on a lot of other films as well. We're always looking for new technology, new creative ways of approaching this kind of storytelling universe. And the idea of being able to add these elements to your real world is incredibly inspiring to us. And sitting down with Roni, well, we just, we kind of saw the world in a similar way. We were both similarly uh, aiming at the same things. Roni, what do you what do you remember about meeting these guys? Um, it's it was incredibly inspiring. Uh, I think like a lot of tech geeks growing up, uh, you watch Star Wars as a kid. You're overly influenced by it. I think I, I started my first company, which is a robotics company, probably because of all the droids in Star Wars. Um, they were the droids I was looking for. Um, <laughs> and then I, like the next company was like, well, this whole Star Wars chess thing, someone's got to make that happen. And that was like a launch pad. It got a lot more intense, uh, obviously. But it was really being inspired by the creativity and technology in movies that got my brain going. And it's that creative inspiration that was looking for, let's build tech around it. I think probably what I've been doing since college is, how can I make the things in movies real? Um, and a lot of people in movies are like, let's think about science fiction. And I've been like, how do I make that science fiction a reality? Um, and ILM, in, in particular, was like one of those inspiring places in the early 70s, inventing all these techniques that inspired almost everyone I know, whether you're in tech or special effects or film. Uh, John, basically working on The Matrix, it was incredibly cool to suddenly meet John and Rob and go, okay, this is probably a dream come true in terms of capability, uh, likeness of thinking and culture. So um, I think we were fated uh, to sort of have this happen. A dream come true or a mutual recognition that you both live in a dream? Uh, Ooh, exactly. Uh, no, we, we immediately realized that we were living in a simulation being run from the future. That, that began, or Philip K. Dixon. It, began, it began a series of conversations about how to get out of that and partly uh, involved a hack through this methodology here. Yeah, I think we freak ourselves out like, are we in a sim? It's like, no, okay, probably, but let's keep going. Yeah. Um, so in the spirit of keeping going, um, <laughs> it's lovely to have you here today, but there's a reason why you're here, and yeah. maybe now is a good time to tell the audience. Absolutely, yeah. So we are announcing a collaboration between uh, Lucasfilm and ILMX Lab and Magic Leap. We're building a collaborative laboratory uh, right in San Francisco, uh, right adjacent to our offices where XLab works, where we'll be able to work and create and co-invent uh, some of the technology and, of course, the content and the creative that's going to go into powering the future. So uh, this is an exciting announcement, something that's been more than a year in development as we've gotten to know each other, uh, done a bunch of experiments together, and now we're taking it up a level and uh, letting the world know what's going on kind of in the secret lab. Yeah, what's, what's really cool about it is the, the combined team there has an amazing universe of almost infinite storytelling capability, and it really starts with story. It's kind of like, wouldn't it be cool if, and then the Lucas guys say, well, let's build a little story around it. And we've been testing uh, these experiential story moments and trying to make mixed reality not a novelty, but a way filmmakers and, and others can actually create real experiences and things that you know, elevate and add to the universe of something like Star Wars. Exactly, and, and in, uh, the, uh, the, the makeup of, of X-Lab uh, is uh, the, the strongest parts of our, our company. It's, uh, it's the story group, that, the same story group that's writing the stories that are, you're going to see in cinema across the next decade. And it's the, um, the firepower of ILM's R&D um, at very advanced uh, graphics and uh, other sort of methodologies that are emerging. And it's, it's Skywalker Sound, which has been the leading edge of making soundscapes and, and defining universes through sound. So those three components are actually uh, what XLab is. But at its center, it's about uh, the story experience and where that goes. Um, 
we understand that these emerging platforms are about experience. It's about your experience. Um, it's about placing you uh, in a universe and having story happen around you and to you. So it's really a different, it's a different uh, form that, that we're going to be exploring in this lab. So in a second, I want to move to the, the dream part of this. But let's nail the specifics first. So do you have a sense for where Magic Leap is going to fit into some of the stories we might see in the future? Or are you sort of a step nascent to that? Well, you know, there's, there's some basics that have to happen. I mean, um, we have to understand. In order to, to place things in your world and around you and react to you, um, we have to uh, define the world first. It's reality that we're sort of is our canvas. So there's a lot of, a lot of hardcore advanced technology uh, being trained upon that. Um, and it's about um, the integration of fantasy into your everyday life. Uh, the reason why uh, Lucasfilm and ILM are interested in this is for 40 years we've been essentially combining fantasy with reality, even though reality in the, in the past has been photographed, but it, in, to some extent it is reality. We are evolving towards basically making the world our canvas, right? And your eyes are the camera. So that is first, first is the fundamentals of integration. So um, are you going to be co-located? So how's that going to work? Because yeah, so you guys are in, technically in, in Florida. Right, so our main campus is in uh, Florida, uh, South Florida, but we have a kind of a semi-secret team in Mountain View that works on a lot of computer science and computer vision. And with this partnership, we're going to be putting a, um, a lab literally like, like just from here to the back of the room. There's a Yoda fountain, and then you're all of a sudden where these guys are. Um, so there'll be a Magic Leap uh, secret lab, not so secret anymore, on the Presidio campus, um, where there'll be a portion of just Magic Leap plus Lucas and X Lab kind of activity. And another portion that will be, uh, um, uh, we'll firewall it away. There'll be a place for Bay Area developers to come in and hack on Magic Leap when we sort of open up that section. So the sort of secret lab with these guys opens first, and we learn a bunch of techniques, and then uh, there'll be all sorts of uh, interesting developers and hackers and makers hopefully showing up on the campus as well. Excellent. Um, and, you know, so John, you brought up the idea that um, reality is the canvas. And um, that introduces this, this sort of interesting thing, which is this, this changes all the rules we've ever had about how to tell a story. <laughs> And you're in the business of trying to figure out how those rules change. Um, how do you lay down the rails to even be able to explore that question? It's a good question. I mean, um, I'd say any, every person is an expert at being a human being. So first we have to understand how people uh, sort of live in our world and how story is actually already happening all around them. Uh, you can walk out of this building and go out on the corner and story is happening all around you. You're in a destination. It's a persistent place, right? We're here in New York City. Um, in a way, we have to sort of think about things similarly, right? That, that, that sort of forever place is the place where story needs to flow through. Um, so, and how you choose to engage it, I mean, it will be as diverse as there has been diverse uh, sort of uh, opinions about how to approach cinema and games and all other art forms. Um, so it's a wide spectrum. For us, um, we need to understand um, that overlap of the logic of a fantasy universe with the logic of our world here. This is, it's a big riddle. Uh, I mean, one thing we've been uh, doing are like what if tests, like uh, there's there's the movies you go to and there's the assets and things people have, they collect toys. So it's like, what if those toys could fly around and what if they were full scale? And what if you live in Kansas and Moss Eisley Spaceport is now in the back of your school? And you go to school and you see spaceships flying around full scale and landing in the parking lot. Like, the, can you theme your life a little bit around you know, a property like Star Wars? Can you go to a local coffee shop and see certain friends who might have been in a cantina? Um, you know, could you make life a little bit more interesting, a little bit better, just slightly tinged 
Uh, you know, that could be like this background radiation of, uh, of a cool IP throughout it's, the day. It's a, it's a form of escapism, for sure. And the steps between, like, the full world where you can skin your world and you can have, you know, you can say, hey, today is a Star Wars day and you're going to have ships flying around and you're going to have things on your wall. Between today and there, it's all by prototypes and experiments that we've been building. Um, some together and some ILMX lab experiments that, that, that we've already shown that aren't yet built on Magic Leap. So we did this little VR experience called Trials and Tatooine, which was a thing we showed at the Game Developers Conference this last summer. I did some play tests with people. And it was really about first person storytelling experience, a very simple, short experiment, just to kind of answer some of those questions for ourselves and, and for the community, like how do these elements interact with each other? How do you have agency in a story, in a universe that you already are familiar with? Is it going to be fun to introduce some gameplay interactions in there? And all these things are contributing to um, our learning and I think the community's learning about how to do first-person experiential entertainment in these new developing spaces. I mean, one, one sweet spot. Sorry, go on. Thank you. Um, Rob, you bring up VR. And I'm curious to hear all of you think about the relationship between VR and MR, whether it's a continuum or whether they simply enable really different things and what we know about that. I see it definitely as a continuum. I think that, you know, when you have, it's interesting, in visual effects, of course, we started out with all practical visual effects, and then we went to heavily digital, um, you know, for a number of years where there were a lot of digital effects and very few practical effects. And today, I would argue that some of the best mix and some of our best work, certainly, that we're doing right now is the best of the practical world and the very best of the digital world. And that it makes the most compelling and believable expression of some of these stories that we would like to tell. And I think there's opportunities in storytelling in augmented reality where you are building on the real world. Um, you're using real spaces, spaces that are big that you can fly big ships around um, that, that benefit from that. And you're using the best of the real world and the best of what we can do with synthetic computer generated objects that we can add to that world. It feels like we're headed in the same direction in terms of immersive storytelling experiences. And, and there is a dial, right? We, Reality is zero, right? It's pure, right? Um, you can turn that dial and you could add one element to your reality. You can continue turning that dial and you can start shrink wrapping your world. And you can turn that dial all the way and it's pure immersive, it's fully virtual. Um, there is definitely some destination out there at some point, maybe it's a decade, right? Where these things converge and we're choosing where on the spectrum we want to uh, sort of blend uh, magic into our lives. I think the, on that spectrum, I totally agree with these guys that there's a spectrum in what we're building as a digital light field. Um, I think of mixed reality as exactly that, from zero to 100%. But I think the sweet spot is uh, something that I think of as neurologic truth. Like you're in a real space, you see your hand, you have a real prop, you're holding it, and suddenly it works. And suddenly there's real people, but then there's this digital thing that's there, and the ceiling opens up, and a giant robot thing comes through it, which we actually did. Um, and you're, you're buying into it as sort of an escape uh, into that story much more than anything else I think I've ever experienced. Because you have all these elements that are telling you this is real, and this digital thing very well blended. Uh, so it seems to be an incredibly good way to do things um, uh, in the real world. And I think it also works in film. I think the the, the taking a step back to practical effects and CG seems to be something audiences like. And, and somehow our eyes can still detect too much synthetic. So that blend really seems to be a very, uh, people seem to have that happy medium. And I think we're searching for that with these yeah. guys together. You know, one challenge about uh, talking about this is it's very hard to imagine if you've never seen it before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have some tools that let us imagine it. and. Um, we, in fact, we have a short clip of a film that I want to run in just a second if you guys are game. Um, but I should say that there's a difference between that and actually demoing it, that it's pretty much, it's, it's impossible to capture. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, slightly sad is that what we're doing, you can't actually experience by video because you really have to experience it in your, own, in your own system, in your own brain. But it is a bit of, it's like a shadow of what we're doing, but at least it gives you an indicator. Um, it, it lacks all the presence and punch, and there is something there that you completely believe. You're, you're right on the money with that. It's, it's perceptual. So when you are looking through the Magic Leap system, you're not necessarily just, you're not seeing a, a plane of media. You're perceiving 
an actual thing in your world, a thing in your space, and um, and there is a certain amount of uh, belief involved, right? So, right. as we go through the years and things become higher and higher fidelity, and they absolutely will, and they will in quick periods of time, um, you'll start believing that which you see, and it'll stop becoming media, and it'll start becoming something that is with you. But to, the, to that end, this test, what we did, just so it makes sense, um, it's, it's an approximation, but we're actually shooting through real hardware, Magic Leap hardware, that's, that we brought our digital film camera and stuck it behind the lens and actually photographed through it. And as we rack focus on the synthetic objects and the real world that we're photographing, all that stuff just sticks together. So you'll see a little bit in this clip. So this is a, a real office environment where we're adding some stuff. And I guess we can talk about it a little bit after you see it Great. too. Great, so let's roll the film. Oh, might I have a word with you please? Uh, I regret to report that due to unforeseen circumstances, we have not yet reached the desired arrangement with Jabba the Hutt regarding Captain Solo's death. An army of stormtroopers is searching for us. It can only be a matter of time before we are blasted into spare parts. Oh, I told you it was dangerous here. We have not yet completed the mission. How did we get into this mess? I really don't know how. So just a quick word on that. Um, when you're, when you're actually experiencing it, you see uh, R2 and 3PO, they are the droids that we are looking for. It's one of the key words we wanted to get in there. Um, plus somehow we were gonna try to do scruffy nerf herder, but there was no reason to put it in except for those threw it in there. Um, uh, but, but basically they're, they're, they're metallic, there's no pixels, they're standing there, they're just as real as these two guys. They're still real. Um, and then we were trying to also simulate what a Star Wars universe hologram looks like inside a Magic Leap light field. So the part where you see these grayed out like, like little ships, that's sort of like a Star Wars universe hologram. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It was like a second derivative hologram. What we do actually isn't a hologram. It's a light field stimulating a visual cortex to create like a neurologic reality and then stimulating what a movie-like hologram is. So it was kind of a really cool test of those two things. I don't know if you guys want to. And we've, and we've done tests with uh, Roni and uh, his, his crew for the last year. And there's no, there's no post-processing whatsoever. That's live in the room. And that was not too long ago. Yeah, and they're aware of the environment. Uh, that, you know, as R2 goes behind a table, the table is blocking him, so he goes behind it. So it's like they're there minus the atoms, which is really cool. And if you think about where we can go with just something like that, uh, we were talking about 3PO. And imagine a 3PO that has real 3PO intelligence. He speaks 10,000 languages in bocce and Mandarin. And he's there with you throughout the day and explaining the world to you. And that seems like a much friendlier way of introducing things like AI to your life because he's a good character. You know he's not going to do bad things. He's not going to take your personal information. He's your friend. So something like that is a really cool thread. <laughs> Absolutely um, won't do that. And, uh, and, and as you know, <laughs> you might make corny jokes, right? And as you know, because uh, C3PO tends to be, have a lot of anxiety about the, because <laughs> he's a protocol droid. I mean, like, he brings with him his world, his thoughts, his universe, right? As he, as he thinks, um, he, he can only relate, you know, to what he's seeing through that which he knows, right? So, they're in overlaps, right? Two universes, yours and theirs. So, John, you've been in the business of dreaming up the future for a very long time now. How does Magic Leap compare to other technology that you've worked with? Well, as I mentioned it before, um, what they're on to is, is, is border, bordering on perceptual media, right? We, it's hard to explain that until I can't give you in words to make you imagine it, right? Um, there's traditional media, things that we look on screens and things like that, and we know that we're separated our life from that media, right. but the method that Magic Leap is, is approaching here is, is really 
about trying to have your brain believe that which you see. And I can't, I really can't explain it. I can't give you words. You will get to try it uh, when you can, and you will understand what I'm talking about. Are we going to move to a place at any point in the near future where more people will be able to demo it? Yes. <laughs> Are we, in fact, Scruffy all demoing it right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, all of you, I want to thank you for joining us, if, in fact, you joined us today, um, and welcome you back next year for another longer video. That would be awesome. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much,